Income tax 2023-2024 cash method. Get ready and some coffee so we can stave off the government attack with income tax preparation. Okay, maybe we can't completely stave off the government attack, but we can like slow them down a bit maybe. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our crunching numbers is my cardio product line. Now, I'm not saying that subscribing to this channel, crunching numbers with us, will make you thin, fit, and healthy or anything. However, it does seem like it worked for her. Just saying. So, yeah, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise. So you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Most of this information can be found in publication 334, Tax Guide for Small Business for Individuals Who Use Schedule C Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Looking at the income tax formula, remember in the first half of the income tax formula, basically an income statement income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income here having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income the schedule c for a sole proprietorship rolling into line one income of the income tax formula which is a little strange considering the schedule c itself is basically an income statement having business income minus business expenses otherwise known as business deductions resulting in in essence net business income which rolls into line one income of our income tax formula which is reflecting the calculation on the first page of the form 1040 where the schedule c ultimately rolls in to line number eight additional income from schedule one this is the Schedule 1, Additional Income and Adjustments, Part Number 1, where the Schedule C rolls into Line 3, Business Income or Loss from the Schedule C. Here is the Schedule C, Profit or Loss from Business, which basically has a P&L, Profit, Loss, or Income Statement Format, Business Income minus Business Expenses or Deductions. We're now looking at Accounting Methods, noting that when we think about business income, if it's a sole proprietorship, we have to attach the Schedule C, which makes sense from the standpoint of an income tax, because that is basically an income statement format, the performance uh, record or the performance financial statement, as opposed to the balance sheet reporting a point in time. And the next thing we have to do is think about the bookkeeping side of things if we're going to have a financial statement report in essence on the schedule c of an income statement should it be on a cash based method an accrual based method or some kind of mix between a cash or accrual basis noting that in the past we talked a little bit about the differences between the two remembering that taxes normally are on a cash based system for most normal deductions, like the Schedule A type of deductions. However, when we go to a Schedule C, then we want to choose the accounting method that is most appropriate and, of course, one that we're allowed to be uh, taking. So we might be on a, on a cruel based method on the Schedule C, even though we have a cash-based method when deducting items, say, on a Schedule A, the itemized deductions. We might elect on the Schedule C, a cash-based method, which is usually an easier method to use, although it's also easier to manipulate, and the tax code will sometimes still force us to do accrual type of things. We have to make sure that if we choose a cash-based method, that we want that to be our long-term method because we have to then have consistency after we choose the accounting method, it not being impossible to change methods after that point, but a little bit more difficult and we need to get basically approval uh, usually to make a change to the method. So we want to make sure when we first do the tax return for the first year that we pick the appropriate method 
and uh, that we want to stick with for a long period of time generally. So most individuals and many sole proprietors with no inventory, notice the key term inventory, use the cash method because they find it easier to keep cash method records. Why do they put the inventory in there? Because inventory is one of those things that will often force us to deviate from a cash-based method, at least with regards to that important point of the business inventory, which obviously, if we sell stuff, is a very critical part of our business. We sell actual inventory. Inventory on the books as an asset is an accrual type of thing because we're basically putting it on the books as an asset instead of expensing it at the point in time that we purchase uh, the inventory and then expensing it at the point in time we use the inventory or give it away, sell it, in other words, to make uh, the, the, the revenue. So is it possible to have a business with inventory that is still on a cash-based system? Possibly in some cases, if you don't have a lot of inventory, for example, if you have a just-in-time kind of system, uh, then, then maybe, but when you're dealing with inventory, you definitely want to be thinking whether or not you're required to be on an accrual basis as opposed to a cash basis and whether or not it'd be more appropriate to be on an accrual basis as opposed to a cash basis. And with your normal bookkeeping, you're also going to have to consider how are you doing your books uh, in terms of tracking the inventory just from a bookkeeping standpoint, which you might want to, of course, mirror with your tax uh, calculations because the tax return is basically a uh, financial statement report, the income statement. However, if an inventory, if an inventory is necessary to account for your income, you must generally use an accrual method of accounting for sales and purchases unless you are a small business taxpayer defined later in this chapter. So note what it says, inventory, then you're going to have to do the accrual type of thing, typically, unless there's an exception for the small businesses. Also note that they, they said uh, the accrual method of accounting for sales and purchases. So now we're thinking, does that mean for something other than sales and purchases, we can be in a cash-based method? You can imagine that's possible because the inventory forces us on the sales side of things to basically be on a accrual method to track the inventory. But when we make our other expense payments, our normal expense payments, we might just be expensing them as we pay them, which means that we're, we're basically more from a logistic standpoint on a tax-based method for other types of purchases other than for inventory, for example. So for more information, you could see inventories later. Income. So under the cash method, include in your gross income all items of income you actually or constructively receive during your tax year. So now the, the question, of course, is when do I have to record something as income? So from a cash-based system, you would think when you get the cash. But that's going to lead people to think that they can manipulate the tax system. So you can imagine if cash is the driving factor, how would people manipulate the system to pay less taxes. They would manipulate the cutoff dates. So for example, on the income side, if someone owed me uh, like $10,000 for work that we did or something like that, what if I said, hey, don't pay me that $10,000 until January? Well, in that case, I constructively have the money. I'm just trying to manipulate when I get the money, which is of course the type of thing that the IRS is gonna frown upon. The reason we're using the cash method is because it's easier than the accrual method, but we we don't want to get into that manipulation thing where people are abusing the, the easiness of the cash-based method by manipulating cash payments for the sole purpose of avoiding taxes. So that's what that's where we have to be careful, and that's where this terminology comes into play actually or constructively received during the tax year. So if you receive property or services, you must include their fair market value in income. So the other thing that could come to people's mind is like, well, if I don't get cash and it's a cash-based method, then I don't have any income. So instead of you giving me that $10,000, why don't you just give me a car or something like that? Well, obviously, if they gave you a car worth $10,000 for work that you did, that would be similar to them giving you $10,000 and then you giving the $10,000 back in exchange for a car. 
So you have constructively received $10,000. So the bartering situation also will not get people out of the bind of having to record income uh, for income taxes. Uh, you, you still have to record the income legally, uh, even, though you, even though you didn't get cash and you got something in exchange. So example, on December 30th, 2022, a client sent you a check for interior decorating service you provided to them. You received the check on January 4th, 2023. You must include the amount of the check in income uh, in, uh, for 2023. So notice the cutoff situation here. So on de December 30th, 2022, a client uh, sent you a check for interior decorating. So they sent it on the last day of 2022, but obviously it's in the mail. You received the check on January 4th, 2023. Now on an accrual based method, you would have invoiced the client in December 30th, 2022. It would have been in accounts receivable, which is an accrual account and income would have been recorded at that time, which is probably what most people do if they bill clients uh, in that way. But on a cash-based system, we wouldn't record it until we get paid, right? Which means they sent the check in December, but we didn't constructively even have it because it was still in the mail and that wasn't our fault until January 4th. So you must include the amount of the check in income for 2023 instead of uh, 2022. Now, if we did something physically to delay the check, meaning like we just didn't take it out of the mailbox or something, then we had constructively received it. We have consciously not chosen to cash it, which might have a different scenario, which we might see. So constructive receipt. So you have construct, constructive receipt of income when an amount is credited to your account or made available to you without restriction. So you have it, it's, it's basically there in your account or available to you. The $100 bill is sitting on the table. The fact that you didn't pick it up and put it into the account, uh, then that's kind of your fault because there's nothing standing in your way to do that. So you do not need to have a possession of it if you authorize someone to be your agent and you receive income for you, you are treated as having received it when your agent received it. So again, if you wanted to manipulate the income system and say, I want to record revenue in 2024 instead of 2023, for example, how could you do that? Well, you, say, you might say, well, I will just not uh, take the check off of the table, I'll just let it sit there until January, then I'll deposit it into the bank account and I won't see it hit the bank account until January. It's like, okay, that may, that's true. You won't see it hit the bank account, but there's nothing that was restricting you from depositing it f and before that time. And therefore you would think it would have to be recorded before that time. You might say, okay, well, what if I have an agent that works for me and they have a different checking account than I do and I make the checks go into the agent's checking account, and then I'm gonna let them hold on to it until January, and then they're gonna transfer it from their checking account to my checking account in the business checking account. Well, again, the fact that the agent is holding it and you can tell them to give it to you at, at any given time means that you basically have constructive receipt of it and you're just doing manipulative things <laughs> to hold it in a different account, right? So example, so interest is credited to your bank account in December 2023. You didn't do not withdraw it or enter it into your uh, passbook until 2024. You must include it in your gross income for 2023. Now, most of the time these days, you probably might be doing electronic kind of bookkeeping and whatnot. So if it hits your bank account electronically and you're using like a QuickBooks something or something to track your account, then you're probably going to record it at that point in time. But you can imagine some of these examples happen when there's a lag, which some people still might be doing their books in that way, right? Where there's a lag between when it hits the bank account and when you record it or something like that. Delaying receipt of income. So you cannot hold checks or postpone taking possession of similar property from one tax year to another to avoid paying tax on the income. So again, in QuickBooks, like you can imagine this would work in terms of your bookkeeping, right? You can say, well, I'm just going to hold on to the check and not deposit the check until January. Well, then, yeah, it's not going to hit your QuickBooks account if you're using like accounting software until January. And if you're using a cash based system, 
it will look like you got the income in January. But that's not exactly correct because you're manipulating the system. You could have deposited it into your checking account in December because you had constructive receipt of it. And that's basically when it should have been recorded would be the, the general idea. So uh, you must report the income in the year the property is received or made available to you without restriction. So example, a service contractor was entitled to receive $10,000 payment on a contract in December 2023. They were told uh, in December that their payment was available. At their request, they were not paid until January 2024. So in this case, you can kind of imagine that you did work and instead of hiring someone else to act as your agent and say, you pay that guy and then that guy will transfer to me in January. We said, you can't do that because the agent is clearly acting on your behalf and there's nothing restricting you. In this case, it's kind of like the contractors acting as your agent, right? The contractor saying the work is done. You did the work. You've earned it. I'll pay you the $10,000 right here and now. And you're saying, no, hold on to it until January. Well, now the contractor is kind of acting as your agent and just paying you whenever it's okay to pay you. And again, the only reason that's happening is to manipulate the cutoff of the taxes. And therefore the IRS is saying, no, you shouldn't be able to do that. Obviously from a bookkeeping standpoint, if you were on a cash based system, then it would look like, right? You would get the money in, in January. And if on a cash based system, you would record it on revenue at that time. Likely it's possible. It's most likely the case that if you're billing clients, invoicing clients, then you're doing an accrual thing if you're using tax software. And so you might want to make sure again, to choose the right method, cash or accrual, because if you're tracking accounts receivable and using tax software or accounting software, you're probably doing an accrual kind of system because the software is going to recognize revenue on the income statement when you make an invoice. Okay. So, but in any case, so they must include this payment in their 2023 income because it was constructively received in 2023 checks. So receipt of a valid check by the end of the tax year is constructive receipt uh, of income in that year. Even if you cannot, if you cannot cash or deposit the check until the following year. So you have the check, then it's basically yours when you get the check. So uh, you receive a check of $500 on December 30th, 2023 from a client. You could not deposit the check in your business account until January 3rd, 2024. You must include the, this fee and in income. Now, this is probably more of an old example again, because one, most people don't pay by check right now. More and more, it's going to be electronic transfers. But even if you got a check, you, you might have software that you can basically deposit the check with your phone into the account or something like that, right? So it's more likely that it might be an intentional thing where you had someone give you a check and you opted not to, you decided not to put it in your checking account until January so that you can represent the money in January instead of December, even though you earned it and received it in December, which would be a manipulative kind of thing to do in terms of the cutoffs. So debts paid by another person or canceled. So if your debts are paid by another person or are canceled by your creditors, you may have to report part or all of this debt relief as income. So, and that would make sense if you think about it, although it's a little bit confusing at first sometimes, meaning that if you owe someone money like the bank, if the bank was just to say, okay, you owe me $10,000 and now you don't owe me $10,000 anymore. Well, they've basically given you income because that would be like them saying, I'm going to pay you $10,000 and then you give it right back to them to pay off the debt of the $10,000. So relief of debt is basically a form of, of payment. You can imagine people trying to structure payments where cash isn't affected, thinking that they can avoid income recording on a cash based method in a similar way as with a barter or trade situation. In other words, if you're saying I don't have to record income unless I get cash, we said, well, what if I got instead of 10,000 cash, you gave me a car for 10,000. We said, you can't do that because the car would be kind of like that. They paid you $10,000 and then you paid them 10,000 again to buy a car, right? Same thing would be here. If you owed them $10,000 
and you did work for them or something like that, and they relieved your debt for the work that you did, then you earned the relief of the debt. That would be like them paying you the $10,000 for the work you did, and then you giving it back to them to pay off the debt. It's similar to a barter situation. Cash didn't actually change hands, but if you put cash and insert it into the transaction, you can see how it, it would be the same as they paid you for the work you did, and then you paid it back, in this case, to pay off the loan. So uh, if you receive income in this way, you constructively receive the income when the debt is canceled or paid. Now, also just realize that when you do the cancel debt thing with a bank, if they canceled it for some reason, like you're insolvent or that kind of thing, there may be certain programs in certain areas where it could be exempt from income or something like that. So, so that's a different, so you might want to, that could be a special kind of case, but the general overarching rule would be if there's a forgiveness of debt, then that would be like you got paid, right? So for more information, see cancel debt under kinds of income in chapter five. So repayment of income. If you include an amount in income and in a later year, you have to repay all or part of it, you can usually deduct the repayment in the year in which uh, you make it. In other words, you've got income this year and then next year there was a return of, of merchandise or there's a complaint about the services that you did. So the $5,000 you got this year, you had to pay back in the next year. What do you do in that case? Well, uh, you might say, well, I have to amend the, 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 the prior year. I have to fix the tax return because I didn't really earn that money because I, because I had to pay it back. But amending the tax return is a pain to do. The easier thing to do would be to take care of it in the current tax year. So you would think that you might be able to get a deduction you know, in the current tax year. Why? Because you recorded it as income in the prior year and then you had to pay it back in the current year. So in the current year, it would be like a return uh, deduction or something like that, you would think. So if you include an amount in income and in a later year, you have to repay all or part of it, you can usually deduct the repayment in the year in which you make it. Uh, if the amount you repay is over $3,000, a special rule applies. For details about the special rule, you can see repayments in Chapter 8 of Publication 17. Expenses. Under the cash method, you generally deduct expenses in the tax year in which you actually pay them. This includes business expenses for which you contest, uh, which you contest liability. Now, so on the expense side of things, expenses are deductions. They're typically like good, for example, on a cash-based system. You would think you would record the expenses when you actually pay the cash rather than when the work was done. Uh, in terms of now you're purchasing the work or goods were uh, received. How that's usually easy. That's usually the easy thing to do. If you're using a QuickBooks system or something like that for bookkeeping, then maybe you have your bank feeds set up and every time you pay something, you're recording it as an expense in essence when you pay it. However, you can imagine that people can try to manipulate the cutoffs on the expense side of things. How might they do that? Well, if I wanted less income in 2023 to be reported to lower my taxes, I would like to have more expenses. How can I get more expenses? Well, I could prepay some of my expenses. So for example, the rent that I owe next year, usually a big expense. What if I pay like five years of rent in advance this year because I happen to have a good year, which is pushing me in, into a higher tax bracket so I would like to take the expenses this year. So as long as I pay it before December, it's a cash-based method, I should get the deduction. Well, the IRS might bulk at that because again, you're manipulating the cutoffs due to the cash-based system in a way that's being done specifically to lower taxes rather than for any bookkeeping or business reason. So, so again, these cutoff areas are where we have to be careful with the cash-based kind of system and where the IRS might try to limit uh, what we can do with it. So however, you may not be able to deduct an expense paid in advance, or you may be required to capitalize certain costs as explained later under uniform capitalization rules. 
So the other variation or deviation from a cash-based system we have uh, is when we purchase large items. And that simply makes sense because usually the cash-based system is going to be basically expensing things pretty close to the time we consume them, like with the uh, utility bill, the water bill, we pay them right after we consume those things. And so it's pretty close in time. But some things we know are very different in time. So if I purchase a building, for example, and I, even if I pay $100,000 cash, cash right there for the building, if I write off a $100,000 building for taxes, that seems excessive given the fact that I'm gonna use that building for 30 years into the future. Therefore, from a bookkeeping standpoint, we will typically want to do an accrual thing, put it on the books as an asset, and then depreciate it over its useful life, allocating the expense over the time period that the building was actually used. The, cat, the, the tax code will basically do that, even though we don't have a balance sheet to track the fixed assets, we might have a depreciation schedule, which is kind of like part of the balance sheet, allowing us to allocate the cost over the useful life. So we'll talk a lot more about depreciation in, a future, in future presentations. Expenses paid in advance, you can deduct an expense you pay in advance only in the year to which it applies. Example, so you are a calendar year taxpayer and you pay $1,000 in 2023 for the business insurance policy effective for one year beginning July 1st. So you can deduct $500 in 2023 and 500 in 2024. Insurance is the classic example because insurance, unlike most other expenses where, for example, the phone bill, we pay for the phone bill after we use the phone, insurance, by definition, we pay for it before we get the insurance. You might say, hey, we never get anything from insurance. I just pay and I never get anything. I only get something if I get in an accident. But uh, that's not exactly true. What you get is coverage. So even though the insurance didn't pay out, we're getting future coverage. So that therefore, if we pay, if we prepay the insurance, then again, we have a prepayment, classic example of a prepayment. And the question is, what amount can we deduct in the current period? Now, you can imagine, again, anything to be prepaid in this situation in a similar way. You can imagine calling the phone company and saying, hey, look, I'm going to prepay a bunch of money up front. And then you just tell me when I owe you more money right? You would have a similar thing where you can't deduct it 10 years out because you paid the phone bill in advance. You can't deduct, you know, the rent because you paid five years in advance of rent uh, in the current year. It's just that insurance, you have to pay it in advance. So it's quite common. That's why it's the textbook example.